uh, BC granulated white, $4.77 at Woodward's Famous Food Floor. Say, it's a good time of the year to start with the bananas and make yourself a fresh fruit salad. You'll find all kinds of fresh fruit at Woodward's as well. Woodward's has it all. Buying a used car is a tough job, even for experts. At Town Center, we give all of our cars a thorough safety inspection. Also, Town Center has available an exclusive four-star warranty, an eight-day money-back guarantee, a 30-day 100% warranty, a one-year shared expense warranty, and a three-year powertrain 25% discount on parts and labor. See us now at Town Center Chevrolet Oldsmobile across from the Guilford Shopping Center in sunny Surrey. Good morning, I'm Tony Parsons with Jack Webster for the next 90 minutes. Two things I said I would never do during my career in television. One of them was substitute for Norm Grumman on the weather when he was away or on vacation. And the other was do this particular program. But I'm here this morning for the next 90 minutes. I won't do the weather at all. I'll stay away from that. But we have 90 minutes of uh, information coming up. We're going to talk, uh, among other things, about um, jobs and unemployment, and especially to Howard McCurdy, who's a member of the NDP, uh, part of an action group crossing this country, finding out about the lack of jobs and uh, the way people feel about it. We'll also be talking about funding of the arts in Canada, or the lack thereof. Uh, preeminent artist Jack Shadbolt is one of our guests to talk about that. Marcel Mass, the communications minister, is in Vancouver to talk to his provincial counterparts today about that. Uh, with Mr. Shadbolt is uh, playwright novelist John Gray, who has some very definite views on the, the cutbacks at the CBC, the National Film Board, and so on and so forth. If you think you have a gifted child, you'll be interested in our third guest because uh, that's her particular area of expertise. Her name is Joyce Juntun. She's the executive director of the National Association for Gifted Children. All those things coming up on this morning's Webster program. Just before we went to air that this morning, we checked with StatsCan on the latest unemployment figures in Canada and in B.C. Uh, you may be shocked to hear, or you may not be shocked to hear, that across Canada, the figure is something like 12.2% of the population of out of work. It is 16.4% in this province, and that's 220,000 people who are without jobs. And if you are one of those people, um, you'll take small comfort in knowing that in France, the unemployment rate is about 12%. In Britain, it's about 13%. Um, waiting for jobs can be a punishment in its own right. Some people wait at manpower offices, some wait for the morning newspaper to come out with the latest offerings from the classified ads, and some wait at the union hiring halls. But the hiring halls are these days probably the least likely place that you'll get a job. If you're a plumber, you probably will wait over two years before your number comes up. And electricians will wait 18 months. But a group of unemployed tradesmen have gotten tired of waiting and they've decided to do something about it. They've created a construction co-op. It is a non-profit outfit that hustles jobs and keeps their members working. Mark Schneider has that story. This is the waiting list for the operating engineers. And depending on what your skills are, you could find yourself waiting two and a half years before your name comes up for a job for you. Or if you're really desperate, you might try this, a co-op for tradesmen, non-profit, run out of this incredibly small little office in Vancouver. Okay. Thanks very much, Mrs. Singh. Yeah. Okay, so she wants the price right, right away because they want to go on that, so I'm going to have to call in some suppliers for that one. Um, the idea of a co-op was the brainchild of unemployed tradesmen. One year later, they now chart the progress from initial job estimates to completion, enough work to keep most of the 30 members at least partially employed. There's no profit involved, only shared costs, and it's better than waiting at the hiring hall. Here as a group, we can take people and, uh, and work together and get more results. We can bulk buy materials, we can bulk buy advertising, we can do that in many different areas in many different ways. And it saves the overhead, it keeps our overhead substantially lower than any other company because we're not charging like regular company rates here. 
not paying company rates means on occasion that office staff have to pack their own ladders to the job site. It means getting jobs like this painting contract in Carisdale, jobs that union painters couldn't ordinarily go near. Because I've noticed there's some blistering there, so just wondering yeah. if that was fresh paint or not. No. no okay. Well, that's good. Well, I was working on the end around there one morning. That's, that's good, window, then. That window was done the other day. Uh, that's what I'm saying. It's got to be redone already because it's blistering. Not finished. Yeah, that's good. Uh, this is one of your members? Yeah, Introduce this is, me. This is Ernie. Hi, Ernie. Hi. Pleased to meet you. Watch the, the grease on my hands. Oh, yeah. A little sticky there. How's the job? Going pretty good. Uh, it is, eh? Yeah. How is she getting paid? Well, you see, the, the thing on this is it's just a job done. This job is continuation of something. Are you getting else. paid on an hourly someone rate? Someone else started this project. You yeah, see, how much are you getting? Just finishing it off. How much are you getting paid? So we're just selling it at about 15 15 an hour? Yeah, right. Is that what he's getting paid? Fifteen dollars an hour? Um, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I would. I would say he's getting about fifteen dollars an hour for this job. <laughs> you, I you have to check. I have to check the records. You don't know, do you? <laughs> no. No. Could I'm it not be sure. less than fifteen dollars? Uh, yeah, it could be less. It than could 15. be less. Yeah. How much less could it be? Ten. It, yeah, it could be ten. Very could well. be ten. Yeah, or eight. Or eight? <laughs> well, it wouldn't go lower than ten, likely. You know, but we don't worry about that. You don't. But it's exactly what the unions do worry about, their jobs done for less. Then we're not in the business of threatening anybody. We recognize, you know, there's a lot of desperation right. around, uh, born out of the uh, awful state of the economy, particularly the construction industry. But I, I think that uh, not so much a threat, but a word of advice with this sort of thing, uh, I think they should be prepared to talk it over with other people and maybe talk it over with their own local union. Uh, before they become involved and maybe uh, find that they're caught up in a web of uh, promises, possibly rates of pay that uh, are never realized and, and just generally uh, a form of exploitation and walk away on a sour note. Uh, I think the union might get a little worried if they think that we're going to be cutting into their market, let's say. What we do hope for is at least one job will come in a day. That's five jobs a week. Five jobs a week can usually employ three or four workers each. Now that can keep a lot of people going. Now generally uh, when people get to know our name better we hope that uh, from the public response that we've been getting so far people like the idea and we're very confident that it'll, it'll grow a lot, a lot faster at this rate. Just a local example of how the unemployed are helping the unemployed and unions are sort of going out of the way to help them uh, I guess as well. NDP member for Windsor Walkerville Howard McCurdy is our guest right now. Howard you're on a cross Canada trip to find out uh, about this unemployment problem everyone seems to be having and this is just a local example of people uh, helping themselves do you have you found any of this anywhere else as a matter of fact that has become a very common strain uh, in what has been heard before our our task force uh, a great many Canadians uh, across the country are increasingly seeing uh, the solution for their economic problems and for job creation in local initiatives uh, they're becoming a little leery about the notion that uh, there can be some magic wand uh, waved by uh, big government in Ottawa or big corporations elsewhere and that everything then is going to be solved. They want to have some involvement in solving the problem of, of unemployment which they re recognize is no longer a cyclical phenomenon, uh, that it's a very deep and structural phenomenon that we're looking at that is putting, is putting people out of work and they want some control over their fate. They want to be involved in creating jobs themselves uh, in concert with other p portions of their own communities. Everyone says that it, the responsibility ultimately is, belongs to government and to the business sector. Is that fair to say, that, that they should be out spending money and thereby creating jobs? Well, <laughs> the, the message is that, that it's not just government and it's not just, just business. Uh, certainly not business in, 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 in the sense of the large corporations. There's a great deal of distrust. They see that uh, any initiatives uh, in the direction of increasing uh, profitability of business is very unlikely to dribble down to them, particularly if, if the businesses involved are foreign corporations or the multinationals. Uh, they see a role. Uh, obviously, they see a role for government. That's why we're there because they want to talk to us about what government should be doing. And they do see a role uh, for business uh, with some guidance from government. But there's a great deal of focus on, on, on local, 
uh, small business initiatives. They recognize the fact that, first of all, most jobs in this country have been, over the last couple of years, created by small business. They recognize that profits in small business are most likely to be reinvested in Canada, uh, that small business is likely to be most innovative, most likely to bring about uh, the kinds of, of uh, developments and new things that will create jobs. But not a great They're also interested, too, though, in, 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 in cooperatives uh, uh, for, a, for a variety of purposes, whether it for be for jobs as worker cooperatives, cooperatives or for housing as, as areas where jobs can be created. Where are, the, where are the worst problems you've run across? Now, you've been in most major cities, major centers across the country. Where are the trouble, real trouble spots? Well, the real trouble spots, of course, are, are in, for example, the, the Newfoundland and, and the Maritimes. Uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia, where the mining industry is, is having great difficulties. And uh, British Columbia, where, where the model of uh, conservative initiatives has, has proven that uh, uh, the federal government may be on the wrong track. I gather you're not pleased that uh, not a great deal of money has been set aside by the uh, government for job creation in the future. Well, uh, what we have is a situation, of course, uh, at the federal level where uh, we were uh, promised that jobs would be the, the, the emphasis. That's where uh, all of the effort would be directed, to create jobs. But in fact, the, the effort was directed towards decreasing the deficit. A deficit uh, which in large part is made up of, of social support uh, program expenditures, uh, interest payments and the like. Uh, the model in, B in BC uh, testifies to the notion that that kind of an approach uh, is, is, a, is a failing approach. And what people want is for, for uh, government, uh, business, uh, for leadership, to address the issue of job creation as a primary goal. When we had uh, established as a goal uh, keeping uh, 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 wage increases and salary increases uh, limited to first five and then six percent as a goal, it was a goal which was in some measure achieved. Well, why not say we're going to create jobs and, and establish a goal for this year and next and the year after of job creation and, and cutting down the, the level of unemployment by some specific measure? Then people would have a little more confidence that the government and business, which claims to be interested in, in, in creating jobs, are really looking out for the ordinary Canadian. We're going to take a break right now, Howard, and we're going to take your calls after a break to Howard McCurdy on jobs and job action across the country. Be right back. Mr. McCurdy, if there's one way to characterize the mood of the people you've talked to, what would it be? What one word? Is it anger? Is it frustration? What, what are they? Well, there's a little bit of both. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, young person that uh, fears that he will never have a job, uh, the older person, the middle-aged uh, man or woman who has lost a job and knows that in present economic circumstances uh, he or she will never again have a job, uh, those people are angry. Uh, they are frustrated because they have little control over it. And what we're trying to do is give people an opportunity to, to have some voice. Um, Mr. Mulroney has indicated that uh, this government will consult. Uh, we're going to contribute to that. Uh, this is the name of the game, is to go, acro go across this land and listen to the people of this country to see what ideas they have. I was going to say, an opposition party doing a cross-country survey, a task force on unemployment with the NDP, it doesn't seem like at the other end it's going to be very effective. It sounds like an exercise in futility. Well, it's not, as a matter of fact. Uh, at least two ministers of the government have been uh, very attentively watching what this task force is doing and what it's hearing. And references have been made to it. And indeed, uh, uh, Flora MacDonald indicated that uh, she's listening and will in some measure determine what she might do on, on the basis of, of the soundings that, that we're getting. But, uh, you know, if we've got a government that says it's going to consult, uh, and they're very busy, you know, and so we're, we're going to uh, go across the country and we're going to, to listen to the people. This will get, gain some publicity, obviously, and, and of course those ministers will hear in some measure what people have to say. But we're going to, to, at the end of this exercise, write a report, and that report will, will be the basis for our, our position in the House of Commons. 
in arguing for certain kinds of initiatives and, and new departures in economic policy. And if the government is going to live up to its promise uh, to consult, not just with the Canadian people, but indeed even with the opposition, they say, then we're going to give them uh, ideas that are worth listening to. You and another part of this, of course, is that, and this is a rather interesting thing, uh, I th and it is that I think people have gotten the notion that a social democratic party uh, has a tendency uh, to see uh, solutions to economic problems uh, based on centralized decisions. And what we're seeing is the evolution of a new policy outlook in this party based on the notion that there should be increasing local control over the economic futures and job creation for people. All right, now let's get some ideas from our viewers. Line one. Line one, good morning. Good morning. Um, in the unemployed statistics, would morning yes go ahead uh, in your unemployed statistics uh, would you have people that are living off their own resources waiting to get jobs would they be included in the figures I, well if I they're if they're they actually are. looking for jobs mm -hmm. uh, if they're w is considered to be on, in the ja job market mm -hmm. uh, they would be listed if people are not uh, looking for employment uh, or if there's any reason to believe that uh, they've given up uh, they would not show on those statistics, mm -hmm. and the consequence of that, of course, is that those statistics vastly underestimate the magnitude of unemployment in this country. So, 16.4 uh, and well, 222,000 could be. Uh, for example, in, in Newfoundland, Newfoundland, 70% uh, of the population is unemployed for a significant portion of a year, and and the unemployment rate there, I think, runs around 25%. Uh, line two, good morning. Hello, line two. Hello. Um, I wonder if I could get the number of that uh, trade school up. That sounds like a pretty interesting idea. I'd like to pursue that. The trade school? This is this is the program you were just <laughs> watching. <laughs> That's the the workers co-op. Ah yes, right. Um, Mark Schneider, uh, can we get a number on that? Uh, and we'll put you on hold right now, a caller, and we'll get you a number. Hold on. Line four. Good morning. Good morning. My questions are: Why are we selling out to foreign investment? Mr. McCurdy, why are we selling out to foreign investment? Are we well, selling out to foreign investment? This is, this is of course, uh, one of the great initiatives of this government is to uh, go down to New York and uh, indicate that Canada is up uh, for sale, that we're going to have a new destiny de de determined by Americans. Um, the notion, the notion that we can create jobs uh, by encouraging uh, foreign investment in the fashion that the New Investment Canada Act would, would have us do. Uh, is just nonsense. Uh, foreign investment can be useful. Uh, I'm from Windsor, Ontario, where we have uh, the Auto mm -hmm. Pact and where uh, we have imposed conditions on uh, American uh, companies with respect to the production of automobiles such that there will, will be uh, manufacture and jobs in Canada. When we control uh, foreign investment such that it behaves in Canadian interest, in our country, then it can be of an advantage to us. But the notion of just opening up the doors so that profits can be can be made uh, elsewhere, and usually jobs elsewhere. Uh, a study done by the United States Senate demonstrated that more jobs were created in the United States uh, by unfettered foreign investment uh, than was uh, produced in those countries where the investment is made. And one of the things that's coming through loud and clear is the realization by Canadians that if we're going to, to create jobs, it's, a, it's going to have to be based on Canadian initiatives. Caller, did you have a specific thing you wanted to say about that? Yeah, I agree with uh, him totally on that. Uh, I've watched a number of programs saying that uh, the U.S. has about 3% foreign ownership. We're sitting at 34, and when the recession hit, what did everyone do? They closed down their plants in Canada. They have no national development or new development up here, so there is no jobs. That's right. Of course, we've got to watch, we've got to watch Canadian uh, companies as well. Uh, Northern Telecom, which has been a beneficiary of uh, many of the tax incentives and tax expenditures on behalf of the Canadian government, and has uh, served Northern uh, Telecom well, is increasingly shifting its uh, uh, manufacture and well, indeed some control to the United, are, a United States. A lot of eggs going into the high-tech basket these days. Yeah, well, uh, there's, there's, there's a classical yeah. example. Mm -hmm. Good morning, line five. Line six, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, I'm uh, one of these people that are on UIC right now, and I have a prospect that's starting a business, but it's, you know, it wouldn't take much money to do this. And being on UIC, 
I started it, I would be cut off, and I needed, I would need some kind of income to get get it going. Now I don't see why, you know, the government couldn't set up something that, yeah, sort of uh, give enough initiative for somebody. They're paying out the money anyhow for the guys on USC. They could be self-employed on that. You mean a lump sum payment of some kind, or something like that? Is that what you're saying? Or even just to keep the payments going for six months until they could get, just get their feet on the ground. You know, the money's being paid out anyhow. At least it's a a possibility. Well, that, that's an interesting idea. Uh, I think that uh, among the things we're listening to and uh, among the things we hope to hear are ideas on how we can encourage small business initiatives. Uh, for example, uh, it's part of our uh, national uh, program that monies be made available uh, specifically in this instance for young people. Uh, low interest uh, loans, uh, forgivable loans, for the purpose of, of starting small business. If, if there's one area of excitement that uh, we see in some, some areas of the country has been the, the uh, uh, initiatives taken by many young people to start businesses of their own. And I think one of the things we have to give increasing attention to is that uh, job creation may not necessarily be uh, encouraging uh, uh, working for somebody else, but rather working for yourself, or working in concert through cooperatives. Uh, and, and that's an interesting idea, and I hope, I hope the, the caller will take advantage of the opportunity to come down and perhaps uh, make, us, make uh, his you, uh, point of view you, heard down at the hotel. Are you going to plug your meeting uh, while you're here? I'll yeah, it's at okay. the uh, Blue Horizon Hotel this evening at, at, at 7 o'clock. Now, we're going to hear uh, uh, formal, uh, short briefs and presentations from uh, a number of organizations this evening, but there will be some time uh, to hear uh, from those who have not scheduled appearances uh, to hear their ideas. One final word. Is there light at the end of the tunnel? Well, I think the idea that we're seeing increasing evidence of across this country that Canadians uh, should and can take control of their own economy and the kinds of ideas we're hearing from them, uh, I think does uh, offer the prospect that uh, we can indeed take hold of things as Canadians and, and create jobs and make this a, a country that is uh, not only prosperous but one which is marked by social justice. Thanks Mr. McCurdy very much. Back Thank in you. a moment with uh, John Gray and Jack Shadbolt. News item from yesterday, spokesman for British Columbia's arts community urged Communications Minister Marcel Mass to reconsider budget cuts they say will, quotation marks, fatally injure British Columbia's culture industry. John Gray, I think you, uh, is that your quote from uh, yesterday? No, I didn't is that say that. that close to it? It's, it's, that's good enough. I don't know who said it, it fatally. <laughs> I don't know what's fatal. You know, it's, uh, the, pro the problem is basically that uh, if somebody, if you get the word down that somebody's going to cut a pound of your flesh, you'd like it done by somebody that knew something about the human anatomy so that you didn't lose something fatal, you know? <laughs> and that's not what's happened. <laughs> Let's establish your credentials, John. Um, I first got to know your work through Billy Bishop Goes to sure, War. Yeah. And I think a lot of people uh, also, uh, that and rock and roll. You've done a film version, I understand, yes, of Rock and called Roll. Yes, called King of And Friday I think Night. we have a clip. Do you want to just introduce that clip for us? This clip is so self-explanatory, it's unbelievable. You can just watch it. All right, let's just watch that uh, clip. It's from, it's called King of Friday Night, and as I said, it's uh, John Gray's uh, rock and roll done in film version. Here we go. Oh, ain't the fat boy funny? See him waddle down the street. Make him run, oh, ain't that fun? The fat boy ain't no athlete. And there's a smile playing on his face Cause in a few more years you'll be laughing Tears on the other side of your face Oh yeah, the last laugh is the fat boy You will see his point of view Talking fat boy talking To the fat boy talking Said the last laugh is the fat boy See the fat boy laugh at you Pick up your ears and listen when the fat boy's talking to you Just a few more years and a few more beers And you will be a fat boy too Oh yeah, the last lap is the fat boy's You will see his point of view Talking to the fat boy, talking Listen to the fat boy, I said the last lap is the fat boy's See the fat boy laugh at you Beauty of 
little friends Vanity and pride Wake up one day and they've gone away And they're fighting for the other side The fat boy learns it early So it comes as no surprise When he finds that he's older And the hair is on his shoulder And the age is in his eyes Oh yeah, the last laugh is the fat boy You will see his point of view An excerpt from John Gray's King of Friday Night. John, I have to say, if, if Webster was here, would say, you want us to spend more money on that? <laughs> <laughs> no, all that, that notwithstanding, what are the real problems that you're faced with, that the arts community is faced with, if, if it well, happens? Well, essentially, uh, besides the, the absolute unfairness of the cuts, in that the regions have been cut far more than the rest of the country, particularly British Columbia, that's supposed to be the, 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 the arts are supposed to be the future of British Columbia, tourism, the Pacific Rim, all that stuff. But even beside that, I mean, the, the Canadian government has, been, has had a war against the culture of the nation it's supposed to be serving since 1970. On the one hand, they've been cutting back continuously with, art, with arts funding. I mean, arts funding hasn't kept up with inflation since 1970. On the other hand, they've been opened the doors and welcomed in an absolute flood of the entire culture output of the United States, a country ten times their size. Now, we had a country here with, with we have no common language, no common religion, no racial heritage, right? We've got a short history, and if we lose our culture, what's going to happen? What, how, what's going to keep the country together? And I don't think that the governments are really concerned with that. I think the provincial government, I think they think culture is something you find in the back of your fridge every couple of months. <laughs> well, why, do you, why do you think they picked on BC, if, if that indeed is what they did? I think that, that there has always been a centralist movement in this country. There has always been, ever since the co Confederation began, the notion that the center of the country is the center of culture, and the regions serve up the raw materials to send to the center of the, uh, uh, of, of, of the country and get culture back. And that's not how this country was designed to work. Jack Shabba, what's it going to do to your particular segment of the arts community? What's going to happen to art galleries? What's going to happen to acquisition programs? All of those areas. Well, it's obvious that all the institutions of art will suffer in the process. Uh, I look on government assistance to the arts as a pump priming activity. Actually, uh, it isn't generally realized by the public, I think, that the arts are an $8 billion industry in Canada and that there are 300,000 jobs involved on the line and that if a percentage of these get similar to the percentage that's happening with other things is, hap is going to happen to the arts, the layoffs are going to cause that much more problems with the, the market. But apart from that, it's a matter of crippling the momentums of these institutions, which will take years to regain um, in cultural terms what Canada desperately needs, as John has been indicating. But more than that, it seems to me there's a whole um, swing that's been going on when you start shortchanging the arts, especially at the early years, which are the years in which Canada Council, for example, has been a marvelous institution in Canada. It's given the opportunities of time and an ability to experiment freely without any hands-on. Is all that going to be destroyed thing. now? Are we going to suffer a setback of some kind? To the younger ones, uh, to give them a chance to get, mm -hmm. you know, the creative people, mm -hmm. because it's the creative people in the early stages, before they can achieve their strength as established artists, who really are the ones who, if they're broken then because they can't survive, uh, we cripple the whole nature of things in Canada. Just take, for example, the biggest, one of the other biggest industries which 
the public, I don't think, ever is thinks about. They tend to think of art as the, the sort of tip of the iceberg that shows up in New York, the little triangle above the top, which is the avant-garde one in which all the dealer galleries and people deal with and is the controversial area. When the real six-sevenths of the iceberg is below. It's mm. in all the hundreds of thousands and millions of objects we use in our daily life. Somewhere along the line, these things have been designed from the clothes we wear, the neckties we have, the shoes we put on, the toothpaste tube we use, all the products that are designed. I've got to interrupt you, Jack, because we have to take a break, but hold that thought. We'll be right back. This morning we're talking about funding to the arts with uh, John Gray and Jack Shadbolt. We'll pin this down a little uh, better for you, uh, John. We have some figures, and uh, uh, they represent the cuts to, uh, among others, the CBC. 85 million uh, mm -hmm. uh, cut to the CBC, 3.5 to the Canada Council, uh, the CRTC 1.5 million, the National Arts Centre a million, a million five off the National Film Board budget and seven million Department of Communications and 9.8 million off the Secretary of State for a grand total of uh, 109.3 uh, million. Now let's look at a few of those. The CBC okay, cut, for example. Uh, what the CBC cut has made, has meant basically 75 jobs and those jobs, those people that have been cut haven't been executives. They haven't been kind of people sitting behind desks reading novels. They're all young kind <coughs> of professionals, mm -hmm. really highly specialized technical and, in, and design people. Uh, for example, Nick Orchard, for example, who is from BC, who was the production manager for the Beachcombers, he was given his letter of redundancy, and in December he was given till April, and uh, in January he went on a trip to England, and within two days he had a, a job with BBC, Bournemouth mm. Studios, North of London. We should and now have, he's living there. I know the Orchard case, and we should also say that he had previous British experience, and it might have been a little easier for him to walk in. Yeah, but the they're all getting, they're all leaving. They're not going to hang around and take on take day jobs like like selling little bits of tinsel down in Hastings and Main Street while mm -hmm. they're waiting for the CBC to rehire them. You know, they're going to get jobs in the states because that's where the jobs are for them. All right, that's the CBC uh, um. culture. Okay, I serve a lot of Canada Council grants, mm -hmm. and the one thing I do a lot of juries. You know, judging kind of applications, and one of the appalling things is the number of household names. I mean novelists and writers and mm. things that you've everyone has heard of famous names right applying for these piddly little grants that you and I wouldn't live on I mean it's just ridiculous okay and they're saying I don't have any money I can't survive I can't write another novel okay meanwhile my brother for example who is 22 he was uh, played with Maynard Ferguson for years like and then he came back to Canada because he couldn't get a green card in the States well he couldn't get a job for a year and a half and now he's living in the States like he's he was playing in the Bob Hope special uh, mm -hmm. this week and he's the first uh, member of our family in six generations of being Canadian that's went to the States that had to go to the States but you, you know? could have you could have done that you uh, you told me about a case in point with mm -hmm. King of Friday Night. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Well, I could have taken King of Friday Night to home box office in the United States, and they were they were willing to produce it. I only had to do two things. I had to have Tom Jones as the lead. I had to have a 45-year-old Welshman from Hollywood to play a Nova Scotian teenager, <laughs> and I had to set it in the United States, you know, and change the, the references and place names to American place names. In other words, I had to turn it into an American musical rather than a Canadian musical. Well, that's basically the choice that you make, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any area of these cuts that you agree with uh, that, that you think is not a bad idea? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, th that's the whole problem, you know, is that, uh, the, uh, for example, the CBC cuts, per se, I don't know. I mean, I would rather see, see the CBC disappear entirely than continue the way it is. I think the CBC is just a farce. You know, I think it needs a complete revamp. It's not a public broadcasting network, and anyone that works there and here's the talk about laugh tracks and this and this is the way the Americans do it. So let's do it that way. You know, knows that they're not the, what we want in terms of a public, but but blindly, like like closing your eyes and blindly slashing kind of millions of dollars isn't going to help any. I mean, any more than kind of if somebody's got wrong, is something wrong with his body, right? You don't just take a knife out and then close your eyes and slash away. You know, hope you hit the right. Thing, you know? but, but you've uh, made a little um, money with the CBC. On the other hand, if you hand the CBC over to the private enterprise, uh, the disaster, you, can you imagine the disaster oh, that yeah. would be well, what, what less that, worse than what's what you're talking about? Then, Jack? What, well, what simply happen? that, that in, the arts are being driven into a position where they're dependent on corporate funding of one kind or another. So is our education system, everything else. The humanities are being shortchanged one by one until they're being dropped out. So 
if you hand over to the corporate thinking all the way through the line and corporate uh, thing, all you do instead of getting what you're talking about is creative activity stimulated in the regions and a growth of something. Mm -hmm. You get more of the CAN programs based on polls of what everybody wants and what was a success in the last one. You get no progress because you get a general repetition of the same kind of thing that's been a success, proved a success, and is a mercantile success. So the arts are driven into a commodity position which reflects right the way down to the artists and everything else. The one thing you do need is that the creative people are given their kind of freedom. And that's why we need things like the pump priming grants of the Canada Council and this sort of thing. They buy them time at a time when they can be free of all restraints in order to innovate. And it's the innovation, which I was saying before, which keeps that designing and packaging industry alive. And that, by God, is one of our largest industries. All our products go out into the world and around about. We're talking about markets. And we're being beaten on the markets by better packaging from Japan and Taiwan and other places simply because we haven't got enough innovation. If well, you, the creative Les arts are a real investment. said this morning. At that uh, point. If I can interrupt you. He said it's not a matter of, of culturalism vis-a-vis -vis nationalism. He said if, if we went that route, the Canadian thing would just shrivel up and die. That's his view, I gather. We're well, not talking well, nationalism. That's, that's, that's the, old, the old number that they usually do on you, right? Is they say that we, don't want, we want to be open to international influences. And if that meant that we were getting more stuff from Romania, Japan, France, that would be just great. But that's not what we mean, is it? We mean we're going to get more American stuff, right? Mm. And what does that mean? That means American values. And what does that mean? That means violence, right? Because America is, is American culture is determined by the marketplace and we all know what sells like I could do it Jack could do it we could all do what sells which is sex and violence okay mm -hmm. now if you want your kids watching more sex and violence if you want your kids to learn that it's okay to blow your enemy's head off and to teach you the correct method of holding a handgun right you know kids playing on the street holding guns like that mm -hmm. now. okay if you want that right all we got to do is is take in more Can American culture and force the Canadian culture in a position where we have to compete directly with them and that's what you're going to get well, I violence. think too there's something even more fundamental you know, anybody knows there's a simple process of growing up like we grow up alongside of, it's like a child growing up alongside of strong parents. He can't have things done for him. He's simply got to learn to do it himself. If we never have the chance to do it ourselves, if we haven't got the pump priming that helps us at the stage where we need it most to get going creatively in these things, before they get the momentum where they start paying returns and all that kind of business, then we're sunk. Uh, we've got to do it ourselves. That's the point. It's nothing against anti-American or anything else mm. as far as attitudes go. It's simply that we've got to do it. I mean, yeah, the, 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 some the, of it, at least. Mm. A big percentage of it. But ha have you been doing that up to now? I mean, uh, are you suddenly now coming on stage and saying, okay, now stop all this because uh, now we've we want to step into it. We've been a long way toward a momentum, especially in the visual arts. I can't answer for all the mm. things John will tell you better about theater and all that, but the rise of the little theater movement in Canada, the small theaters, the rise of the small publications and all that thing is an indication that we are gaining a kind of momentum. Now suddenly, we're going to cripple and freeze. Small publications, for example, are being frozen out one by one. Where do our writers, our new mm. crop of poets, our, it's, all it, the people it's, it's really come from? One of the problems is that we get down on money all the time, and the mm -hmm. problem isn't the money. No. We've seen with the CFDC what throwing money at a problem is going to do for it. We get a great film industry as a result of that money, don't we? <laughs> you know? I mean, that's not, it's not what's going to do it. Uh. The problem is we have no cultural policy. Our government has completely abrogated its responsibility to point a direction that we want to go. And all of the only cultural policy we have is we want less of it. That's basically okay. it. We're going to pause on that note, take a break, and come back and take your calls to John Gray and Jack Shadbolt. I guess one of my concerns is that you may be riding to the rescue a little late. Do you feel that way? That, that you, you, now you're making a noise uh, and you've been prompted to make a noise and it may be a little too late, maybe Marcel Mass is... Well, the point is we haven't. Those of us who've been active in the arts have been doing these things for a long time. John mm -hmm. is, sits on 
Canada Council juries. I've sat on them. My wife's on them. Other people are on them. Uh, it's rotated around the country in a democratic way so that every kind of point of view gets represented. We all say the same thing, that the more we can assist in the pump priming activities, the less we rely on merely perpetual handouts. That's the thing we don't need. That is to say that a symphony society can count on so much every year and so yeah. on without yeah. doing the work to earn it. Mm. Or anybody else. I'm not saying they, do, they don't, but I just mean as an example. Because the entertainment arts have a slight advantage because they can show returns. The other thing that is not visible to the public, and this, this annoys me, all that money that the government supposedly pumps into the arts like this and gives, how much of that are they getting back in taxes? All the, out of that $8 billion turnover, they must be getting back at least, uh, you know, a third of that mm. in taxes so that they're not giving as much as they seem to be giving. That's only a myth. I think that one of the reasons that the drift has occurred, I mean, is, is because it, it's been so gradual. It's just been a gradual pulling back and kind of directionless drift. And you don't kind of get mad until something happens, you know? And then suddenly I started reading that we are in a period of restraint, we must cut back in the arts. And then suddenly I thought, hold it. When was there ever a time when the government ever said, oh my goodness, we're doing pretty well right now, let's support culture, right? It just has never happened. The only time we ever did that, right, was in 67 for Expo, when the government said, well, we better show some Canadian art down at Expo, and they said, holy cow, we don't have any, right? And, <laughs> and so that's when suddenly you had all kinds of LIP grants and all that kind of stuff that was getting young activity going and getting cultural activity going. And once Expo finished, of course, the government said, well, back, back in the closet, fellas. Uh, what I worry about mostly uh, as well as the present situation of people being put out of work and all that in the arts is in the school systems themselves right up through the university where the arts are considered as the periphery of the curriculum when in reality they should be the very epicenter of education because you cannot digest all the other kind of analytical and thinking experience that you have until it's connected with, through your senses to your emotions, it's a three-way thing, the senses, the emotions, and the mind as an analytical thing. And the emotional factor, the intuitive one, and the sensory one are what give the connective principle. The principle of art is the, is the, very, the only principle that resolves all these things into images of our experience, which we can then understand where we've been, what states of mind we have, how we communicate with one another is through images. And the art process is the crucial one. Instead of that, we're being forced to the position where everybody, for, for economic sake, is saying, OK, what's the nearest thing we can chop without any harm done? So we chop the arts, the humanities, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. I'm going to interrupt Jack, because Jack Webster sitting out there saying to me, Parsons, you're being too polite, so we could better go to the one, phone Jack. right now. <laughs> a a call one. from White Rock, I believe. Good morning. Hello. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I would uh, just like to say that uh, I support the Progressive Conservative uh, in their trying to reduce expenditures on the cultures. I feel that uh, our country is in a crisis and the crisis is going to get further and that uh, direction of money into job making and things like that I believe is where the Progressive Conservatives are putting their best dollar. I also feel that money and culture is not necessarily something that goes hand in hand and I feel that many of our great people who contribute to the culture of Canada, I wonder how much money they ever received during their lifetime for uh, their works and that. And also our popular present one, contemporary ones like Lover Boy or Margaret Atwood or Margaret Lawrence. I feel that, um, that the money spent in government is not directed correctly to culture. Thank you. Thank you. Line four. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'd like to just reiterate what Jack had said, that there has to be more exposure to the arts throughout the education system. There is a, a lack of, of emphasis on intangibles such as the fine arts, unless a person comes from a, a musical family or, or something like that, then it's going to be, they're going to be 20 years old before they have a chance to start thinking that they might, you know, be interested in Indian art or music. And I, I think it's important that the school systems emphasize this a little more. I wanted to say something about the first caller's call. I mean, if, if jobs is, is the important thing, our culture industry is our sixth largest industry in, industry in terms of jobs. 
Line six. Hello? Good morning. How are you? Yes, I've got kind of like a two-part question here, and perhaps they can ask. It seems that I've been hearing a lot lately that people think in terms of the arts as being subsidized. And uh, I sort of wanted to use like an example. Like uh, during, during, say, the Renaissance, great or good artists were sought and employed by powerhouses like the church and industry and trading families. And um, that art was sought out, and we have it now because it was good. And uh, I think good art, like anything else, has its rewards, and mediocrity has its. And when we're in a style that we're in now, um, why don't we just let the marketplace? I know that sometimes it seems like artists may have to sell themselves a little harder, but uh, why, don't, why don't we hear more like that? Uh, well, well, that, that's a very good question, and, and it has to do, the reason is it has to do with that a society has to decide what its values are. Uh, if you want the marketplace to decide it, if you take a Monet painting and a penthouse centerfold, put them side by side, and you tell me which one is going to sell. Uh, it depends on what you want. If we want to go by the marketplace, then we will have a culture of sex and violence, and that sex and violence will be reflected in the activities and in the behavior of the citizens of that country. You don't get away with it. Doesn't good art stand the test of time? It stands the test of time, but good artists don't. Well, then I think devotion to it's, it's an art. Granted, artists are different people and they think differently. But I think that if you look at it now, we're in a high-tech society. The other half of it is the touch in it. I think the arts are coming back, and people just have to bide their time. That's why as we get more technical, more and more people are interested in the arts. And like I said before, um, you know, good art will stand the test of time. I would think that in most endeavors, and I think especially creative ones like art, I think 90% of the work is probably done by less than 10% of the creative people. Thank you, Colin. I Time is of the essence here as well. Sure. So I, know, I, I realize that I, because I want to get in a, a bit of a plug for your rally tonight uh, at the uh, Queen Elizabeth Theatre, 8 o'clock tonight, the Rally for yes. the Arts. Um, everybody's welcome, lower yes, people. Yes, 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock tonight at the Queen Elizabeth. Anyone can uh, come. Anyone can come. Yeah. So you, now you know what it's all about. We'll be back in a moment on this morning's Webster program to talk about gifted children with Joyce John Tune, the executive director of the National Association for Gifted Children. Every parent there is is either has a gifted child or is expecting one, right? Joyce, John, uh, not really. <laughs> uh, the the joke I kind of make is it's probably the grandparents who think they have gifted grandchildren rather than the parents think they have gifted children. Is there a dictionary definition for a gifted child? Well, how do you define a gifted child? By and large, uh, giftedness is defined, of course, by any school system or province or so on, uh, by the things they're looking for. But when I talk with parents, I usually say to them that what you're really looking for is what we call symptoms of giftedness, because we know giftedness is a high level of intelligence, but we know we can't test all of intelligence. So we start to look for certain types of behaviors. When, when we see several of these, we start to think maybe we have a gifted child that we need to be working with. You mean if a child at two years old picks up a violin and starts playing Mozart concerti, then you know that is a pretty uh, dead giveaway, get, is that what you know, you're saying? Yeah, you get sus suspicions in a way. I'll, s well, I'll say certain things to parents, such as the curiosity level, the number of questions they ask, the kind they ask, of the child that reads early. There are some children who do not speak, and all of a sudden they start talking. They talk in complete sentences, adjectives, adverbs, the whole works. Um, the intense interest in things that are of a higher level. Um, all children have questions, but gifted children will prob probably be asking about things that we would consider, uh, say, three or four years above what they should be interested in. Um, Fundamentally, if, if they walk earlier than another child, if they talk earlier than another child, is that a sign as well? Yes and no. <laughs> Don't you love that? Because I kind of describe it this way. Giftedness reminds me of navy blue. If you go to the store and try to match navy blue, you find umpteen shades of mm -hmm. navy blue. And so at any one time, this is this season's navy blue. And somehow people say, this is what I see in a gifted child, but you also realize there are all the other shades of giftedness as well, and I wish they would fall into one real easy, definable clump, but they don't. 
So that's why I start to look for indicators and signs. There are gifted children who don't talk until after everyone else. They're so busy thinking they didn't get around to talking. You know? mm. <laughs> are we seeing more gifted children these days than we did uh, 20, 25 years ago? And is it because uh, we're only learning now to recognize them? I think there's two things at stake. One of them was several years ago, we thought giftedness only meant genius. And so we looked for the really high level type of, of student. Now we're saying, all right, we're looking for people that have the potential to become gifted, um, talented, and productive adults. Uh, we are more aware. I think that even this type of thing, media has done a lot to help us understand giftedness is not just the child with the glasses and briefcase. Giftedness looks like every other child mm -hmm. that happens to have a lot of things going on in their mind. Um, I do a lot of traveling, and I remember when uh, 10 years ago, people would say, gifted, what's that? Then five years ago, they said, oh, yeah, briefcase and glasses. Now, by and large, they say, I think I know one of those. So, you know, we're getting there with a uh, greater understanding. The children of television, uh, are they, uh, is that a spur to a lot of uh, children? I mean, Sesame Street, uh, The Electric Company, those kind of programs. Did they bring on some gifted children that otherwise might not have been spurred to recognition of their talents? The nurturing, because one of the things that we know that's a really complex has to do with what we call nature and nurture. You know, what is innate ability and how much can be nurtured. And we know you have to have the combination of both to see giftedness develop. So you can have a child with a lot of ability that is never nurtured and will not show up as a gifted child. You can have one with somewhat less ability that is very nurtured will show up looking better. So mm. it's kind of that funny balance. And I think television has helped to nurture some of that. But we also have to be careful that we're not just looking at good training, that you're looking at giftedness, which is a thinking and a processing in the mind that is different from the average person. Will a gifted child always stay gifted, or does he or she get to a point in their life where they then become normalized in some way. Uh, another talking about losing giftedness yeah. in a way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that there is a point. Yes, there is the point to which a child who had the potential to become that gifted adult really doesn't ever get there. In fact, that's one of the problems in the schools. We can lose them as early as third grade, second or third grade. Mm -hmm. It's what we have. We call camouflaging. They start to act like everyone else. Um, when you ask me that, I have to say that that is one of the things that happened in my own family, which is probably led to my interest, is my sister uh, that had a very sad experience. And I, she wrote about it one day when she wrote to me and I was living in California and said, I realize I will never become what I could have become mm. if I had had a different type of background in nurturing. And I think, yes, no matter what she does now, she'll never be. She's right at where she could have been. So being gifted is not necessarily enough. You have to know, have to have parents who understand and realize the problems inherent in being gifted, who can bring you along and make you realize your potential. Is that basically That's it? That's right, because sometimes we think that just because a person has a high level of intelligence, they can do everything else. Mm -hmm. And we have to keep saying to parents, intelligence does not mean maturity. Intelligence doesn't mean experience. Intelligence doesn't mean tact or social skills. Intelligence only means that you have an intellectual processing. That can go somewhere if. We so right you shouldn't expect a, uh, a prime minister or a president or uh, another Indira Gandhi or a world leader of any kind simply because your child is gifted in one area. I, I suspect that every child, gifted or not, uh, or in this case gifted, has to know something about social graces and development and other areas that might otherwise be neglected. Well, making their uh, intelligence work for them, I think, is what it's about. I often say to teachers and to parents, we really don't want people walking around as a walking encyclopedia. That isn't giftedness. It isn't really what you know that counts. It's what you do with what you know that makes the difference. And that's the person that becomes a creative, productive adult, the one that knows how to use that mind and use that intelligence. So I have a gifted child, and I come to you and I say, Joyce, I, uh, obviously this child's gifted. I don't really know how to handle it. So what is the first thing you try and do? to me as a parent and to the child? A couple kinds of things. The first thing is a basic understanding of giftedness. Sometimes people have a misunderstanding and they portray that misunderstanding. For example, giftedness means that you would always be perfect. And even though parents say, no, no, I don't believe it, they act that way. And so does the community saying, the child gifted? Did you see what they did out in the street today? They can't be gifted. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that they think giftedness means they will always operate at a high level at all times, that they can't be a 10-year-old and go out and hit somebody like another 10-year-old. So it's a basically understanding of, of what giftedness is and giftedness is not. And then the other part is helping parents understand how to nurture that giftedness and the types of skills that a student needs to, or a child needs to make the best of their ability 
and the things that a family needs. Sometimes a family gets off balance. Uh, the giftedness is so exciting or uh, challenging, and they'll say things to me like, I think I just have a gifted child. Um, now, do I have them in the right classes? Do I get them the right books? Um, I think I have to throw their puzzles off. The puzzles are around. And I'll say, now, just a minute. First of all, if we have seen the giftedness start to emerge, you're doing some things right. Let's talk about those. And then let's talk about the other things you can do while you can relax and be calm, because if you overprogram the child, that can also be a very sad all thing. All right, while you're doing that, handling the gifted child, what are you doing? for the less gifted child in your family. Oh, yes. You know, it all comes back to good parenting. Just like in schools, it comes back to good teaching. In good parenting, one of the things that makes a good parent is that each child is an individual. You love them as an individual. You nurture them as an individual. And that's one of the things I often share with parents within the family, is you cannot give more attention to one than the other, but you must be careful that you keep a balance and you keep them all as individuals instead of mm -hmm. expecting them to be alike. Good. You're in uh, town for a, uh, a seminar, a, a workshop uh, on the gift of child. That's at right. The uh, Bayshore, and we'll be back to talk about that and to take some calls from our, our viewers in a moment. <laughs> Joyce, I want to talk about the schooling aspect of a gifted child. Um, do you have to have a specialized teacher of any kind? Do you have to have a specialized environment for a gifted child? Or can they fit easily into the regular sort of school environment? Well, you have to have people that understand gifted and talented children. Uh, one of the things I will often say to both parents and teachers is we have always had some provisions for gifted. Those were those teachers that we always remember that cared about individual students and tried to help each one of them be everything they could become. What we really do in the name of programs for gifted and talented is try to broad base that understanding and the ways that gifted and talented students can be nurtured. And there's a variety of programs out there. And I can't say that there's one better than the other, but by and large, again, it's paying attention to the individual abilities that are there and giving them the chance to grow and fly. Are, are things like the Suzuki method of teaching music, for instance, is that a recognition of, of a gifted child or is that just a system? Is that Yes and no. Because you see, a child can go in there and, again, learn very well how to put all the skills together. A gifted child can also really thrive on that. Remember, giftedness is a thinking and processing. There can be a dancer who learned their steps very, very well, but a gifted dancer will have the thinking and the processing to recreate and reorganize and maybe put together with their own style, their own touch. So there is a little extra something when it comes to giftedness. All right, let's take some questions on the phone. Good morning. Good morning. I'm a single parent of a gifted child who has just turned 17 and going into second year university in the fall. And we've lived through nurturing her around the jealousy and isolation and so on that happened right from about grade four up. And uh, didn't know that what was happening really until later. And I wonder if June have any guidelines because I would have loved to have benefited from this kind of an association. Um, on the way up, and uh, I'm a bit frustrated and trying to feel grateful uh, instead of frustrated or guilty if there was something more I couldn't have done, and I'm still trying to, to nurture this being off into wherever she should be going. Um, do you have any comments on that, June? Yes, Joyce, uh, Joyce that's all right. <laughs> um, Okay, a couple of things. First of all, uh, we'll never have the perfect answer you know, for everything. We'll never have all the, the miracles out there. But there's a lot more information out for parents. And as I mentioned to you uh, before the show, I work for the National Association for Gifted Children in St. Paul, Minnesota. And there are a series of books that are available now for parents and gifted children, uh, like Guiding the Gifted Child, the Gifted uh, Student Survival Guide, and so on. Uh, she mentioned the isolation and the, and the jealousy. It's very important for parents of gifted children to get to know each other and for gifted children to get to know each other because of the social emotional support that's there. Gifted kids do need to find that they're not the only one that's like that. And I hear that comment all over the place. You mean I'm not the only one that's mm -hmm. like this or thinks like this. So it's good to, that the books are now available for people and also that there are organizations and meetings and associations. Um, nurturing to help the, even at this point, I guess I would say to the mother, continue to help the girl feel good about herself and who she is and her abilities is the best thing she can On do. On the screen now, some information where uh, they can get information from the National Association for Gifted Children. Take down that address if you want more. We have a call from Kitimat. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead. Mr. Parsons. Yes. Um, I've got a son right now, he's eight years old. He's been walking since he was six months, okay. reading and speaking full sentence since, since uh, 
since he's been two years old, mm -hmm. and uh, his life in school has been uh, aided by drugs since he started to keep him calm down. And he's got so much energy. He's an excellent behavior. <laughs> we would like to try and get this energy in the right direction. And we've been watching diet and everything else just to try and keep him calm down, but there's so much potential there that we don't really know how to uh, funnel it in the right direction. Is that a typical profile, Joyce? Uh, many gifted children have a lot of energy. I think one of the frustrations in, uh, to parents of gifted is many times they need less sleep than the parents and they still get along and it's very difficult. But I think his point is right in channeling. Uh, part of the channeling process though is to help the gifted child be a part of making these channeling decisions. I find parents saying, do this, do this, do this, do this, and the child saying, hey wait, it's out of my hands now, I don't have a chance. I try to help gifted children do two things. Find their own interests and passions and go for it and work in that area and try to make school a winning setting for you even if somebody else has it. And those, both of those two things take a lot of energy and it's directed energy. What can happen is the disbursement of energy in so many ways it doesn't get focused. So I, th I really think this father's right in saying start to find some special areas that that child can pursue and help them find those opportunities and support that and direct that. Now when they change to another specific area, go with it again. But gifted children do need a special focus area in their lives at all times that they say, hey, I, I love shells. I want shells 24 hours a day. Go for it. Mm. Good. Victoria, good morning. Hello. Good morning. Yes, sir. How are you? Um, did you listen to the pro program previously before you? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. I heard. Did she just listen to the one that was just before her, the one talking about the arts? Yes, I was oh, here. Oh, yes, I see. Mm -hmm. The thing I was getting at was, like, the talk about cutting it back, and I was wondering, what do you think, how that will affect to get the children? Because the perfect outlet for them, because they develop their intelligence and it gives them an artistic outlet. Yes, there are, I believe in artistic and cultural outlets for giftedness. And that's one of the things that we talk about in the schools and the parents of gifted is to find outlets for the ability and the creative ability. Uh, this can happen in the schools, it can happen in communities, it can happen in the, in the families. Um, I guess one of the things that I'm a strong proponent of is that there isn't any one place or any one person totally responsible. Everyone shares some responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that comes from the fact that I grew up in a little farm uh, seven miles out of the country from a town of 400 people. And yet my parents found ways to f have outlets for me and the nurturing that I needed for my gifted children. But I think arts and culture doesn't necessarily apply only to gifted children. Oh, no. Yeah. No, it doesn't. But, it, but he is right in that giftedness needs an outlet, definitely. I was wondering, do you, do you really support the program that's going on? Like, is it, like, does it really matter? Like, what, does, it, what, does it matter for an artistic person to, to have, a, to have a, a way to express his talent? Because if the government didn't support it, business wouldn't. So I'm just trying to stress that how important it is for the government to maintain these cultural programs, like the CBC and mm -hmm. CRTC, etc. Yeah. There's a lot of other elements in there which not being um, a native of British Columbia, uh, I'm not aware of. I can just say by and large that we need outlets and there are many ways to get those outlets. Let's not draw our guest into that argument again. We're on about gifted children. We understand what you mean, but yes. uh, we don't want to draw mm -hmm. Joyce into that argument. I Thank you. I wasn't stressed long enough in the other program. I just say they're very important and they should be known to the public more why they're important. Okay. okay. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm calling about, um, I know my, actually my little cousin is a uh, gifted child. He's in the seventh grade now. And they wanted to skip him previous years, but my aunt thought emotionally he could not handle that yet. So he's now in the seventh grade, but he sits, he has breaks because the teacher does not know what to do with him anymore because they don't have enough course content to keep him going through the whole day. So now that he's going into the eighth grade, I feel, and my aunt also, but she doesn't know what to really do is that the public school system just wouldn't be appropriate at this stage. Um, do you have any suggestions? Okay. A uh, couple things about the schooling. It's uh, probably uh, discouraging but encouraging to say that though we like to see children have a very outstanding teacher every year, uh, the statistics have proven that if a child has an outstanding teacher four times during their schooling, that is a very good program and mm. they should be very happy. Now that doesn't help you the year that your child has the bummer and you feel that they're not being challenged. Uh, two things are arising here. One is the grade seven, grade eight. That's an adolescent time. And during the time of adolescence, she is right. There is a lot of emotional things that are taking place that even supersede what happens cognitively with the child. Uh, my greatest concern at that point would be 
the child emotionally, how they feel about themselves, and getting in touch with themselves, and getting a control of a setting. One of the uh, things I often work with students in the grades 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, up into high school, is how to make a school setting a win for you. So nothing is happening, and many times seventh, eighth grade are giant reviews of what they had before, mm -hmm. and there won't be stimulating content. So we start to work with uh, families and the students to say, what is it you want out of this subject that you can do? The other thing, which is, of course, my Friday and Saturday working with teachers, uh, is to say, what are things that teachers can do to differentiate what's happening in the classroom, to work on thinking skill development right within the content areas? Uh, the answer isn't just in piling on more information. It's uh, working with that information and taking it in, with, from your own interest area, where mm -hmm. would you go with it? And that becomes, I think, a responsibility gift that children have to take on for themselves. Uh, do you think a, a private school would be more beneficial than a public school? Uh, you have to go look at the school. I say to parents all of the time, if it's a private school or if it's a public school, you go and visit and say, are these the kind of people that will challenge my child that gives a setting that my child would like? Not what necessarily mom and dad want, but what the child will feel good about being in. And there isn't a perfect answer. It's the setting, the people there that make the difference. One more call before a break. Hello. Yes. I would like to ask uh, Joyce if I have a child that's eight years old who is currently gifted, and he is taking an enrichment course at our local school. And would she consider this to be a good source of uh, stimulation for the child? Again, I watch the child to see if this is something the child enjoys, if they're happy in it, if it's giving the stimulation that tells me, yes, a need is being met. The other thing I think it's important to look at is one thing doesn't necessarily take care of everything. Um, programs at a school do not take away the parent's responsibility to the child. And by and large, the parent's uh, work with the child doesn't take away the fact that schools should pay attention to them. So it's one of the things that will help, and that's every time a child has another experience, excellent but it uh, doesn't solve all the problems. There are still responsibilities. That's right. We also work with this child at home. and We have another, uh, his older sister is also gifted and has been put ahead a year and has had no problems. Mm -hmm. But this child being a boy and born in September, I don't really consider that it would be socially the best thing for him. Uh, like I said, watch the child, and I like what you said about at home. I believe strongly in a school-home partnership in working with gifted and watching the individual child. Yes. Thank you. More calls after this. We're talking with Joyce John Toon, the Executive Director of the National Association for Gifted Children, about gifted children, and we're taking calls. Good morning. Good morning. I just wanted to ask if it's a genetic factor that that's, uh, could be why they're gifted, because I've noticed some people calling and saying there's more than one gifted child in the, in the family. Is, is, this the, is it a genetic thing? It's genetics and it's also nurturing. It's a combination of both and we don't really know what the percentages are. Uh, but yes, there are genetic abilities. But if those abilities are not nurtured, they won't show up as gifted. Um, also, that's why, by and large, I will say to school districts are dealing with the parents who are gifted. Remember, the parents are very often gifted if they have gifted children, so you see some of the same factors running through the whole family. What happens if a parent doesn't recognize a child as gifted? Well, it depends on somebody else comes and picks it up. Uh, giftedness has to be nurtured. Sometimes it's the grandmother, it's the neighbor next door, it's the teacher at school, it's someone down the street, um, but left totally to chance. Uh, many gifted children don't make it, and those that do can always relate back to somebody who nurtured their ability and cared about them as a person. I was one of those. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. A call from Prince George. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, I'm phoning basically with some thoughts. I feel there's a lot of inconsist inconsistencies across the province in the classes set up in the school. I'm talking specifically about honors classes. Mm -hmm. We moved. Uh, we had a student who was always in an honors class, and we are now living in Prince George. The school he's in does not offer one. He is taking courses this year that he's already completed and achieved A's in at a year younger. I understand it's up to each school individually to offer honors classes, which leaves it, I believe, up to the principal of the school. Now, we moved from a smaller area to Prince George, which is the third largest city in, in B.C. And what do you do in a case like this? 
Well, yes, a couple kinds of things will happen. First of all, you're right that every school decides what they want to do and until there is a, a federal uh, mandate, but I don't see that that happening and I'm not so sure that it's the wise thing to do. Um, look at types of, uh, of opportunities that are available in any particular area. There are gifted students who go out and take courses in the summer or they'll take evening courses or they'll go into one of the residential programs. We would like to see things happening all year long, but by talking with many gifted children, by just going to a summer program, it's kind of like a buoyancy thing. Mm -hmm that keeps them going through the rest of the year. Could she also poll the school and find out if there are other gifted children in the system? Uh, and find children. out there is, as we mentioned, a local uh, association and mm -hmm. that is parents who are trying to get the school to do types of things to uh, benefit giftedness. Sometimes those parent groups themselves organize together and take the talents that are there and find ways to serve uh, gifted students uh, around uh, the school time. Okay, my, this student, is. there's some bitter, bitterness entering into the fact that when he goes to university, the students that have had the advantage of the honors classes will be ahead of them. And the honors class that he was in, the, the teachers just literally took him over the moon. They challenged him so hard. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's just, you know, high 90s averages and hardly even has to do any homework. I don't feel he's lost his motivation, but I'm afraid that it could happen. Um, I would like to see him do, take on some things himself, take on some studies for himself because there are uh, gifted children that are in s rural areas where there's absolutely nothing and we find through their own learning they enter college ahead of the kids that come out of the large high schools. So it, uh, if he doesn't feel challenged in the school, I'd like to see him take on a, a study area of his own and pursue it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, we're out of time for calls, I think. We just have a, oh, we do we have time for one more call? Okay, let's go to Nanaimo. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yes, um, I have three children, and my oldest child is nine. Uh, her father is native, and we found that she's, uh, she's well, we feel that she's very um, talented in lots of ways, especially in drawing. But Lane is a very, uh, she's very hyper, and she's extremely moody. Like some days she's so good in school, and other days, uh, like, <clears throat> she won't, uh, you know, do her work at all, and then other times she... She can just whiz through it in five minutes, you know. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we found that, uh, <clears throat> like, we have a, dis uh, a problem disciplining her uh, is because of her moodiness, and uh, she's a very active girl. She wants to be doing things all the time. Uh, quickly to the point, caller, because we have to get an answer in, in about 20 seconds. Okay. How, like, we're afraid of, like, you know, disciplining her, that it's going to take a lot of her drive, a, a lot of her ambition away. And how do you feel, do you handle these hyperactive children and talented children? It's not going to be a yes or no answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have time, but I'll give you a, a couple of uh, phone numbers after we take a break. We'll okay, so stand by. For those of you who had questions about gifted children and didn't get them answered, you would like to know that uh, Joyce Giantuna is doing a workshop in Vancouver at the Western Bayshore. The number to call for information is 681-3418. 681-3418. There is a charge for uh, the workshop as well. A couple of other numbers uh, for Gifted Children Association locally in the Lower Mainland, 266-6624-278-2732. Tomorrow morning on Webster, Jim Hart is the guest host. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> The street yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.